Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, the co-founder, executive vice president, and the chief medical officer of the CLL Society. Uh, Mark, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, my name is Mark Roshesky. I work here at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, um, and I work in the lymphoid malignancies branch, which is to say that I'm a clinician, I'm a clinical director, and we run um, a suite of clinical trials that test novel agents in patients with a variety of lymphomas, including in some cases, CLL. So CLL has, I say it's a blessing because we're both a leukemia and lymphoma, so we can benefit from the research that's going on in both leukemia and lymphoma. And um, so, but you're doing a lymphoma trial and with difficult cases of CLL, combination therapies and with other lymphomas, combination therapies are commonly used. And you're doing an innovative trial uh, with a new combination that's never been done before for um, CLL. So a couple of the drugs are familiar and one is new. Can you explain that in kind of patient-friendly terms to us? Sure. Um, one of the things that we have done here in our branch um, and, and the way we sort of think uh, we can make impact is to develop combination therapy, as you described, um, and use multiple different pathways, target multiple different pathways at the same time. And when you when you do that successfully, provided it's safe, then you can often get durable remissions, but not have to give therapy indefinitely. And that's one of the things that we've done in other types of B-cell lymphomas. And we thought there was an opportunity here to do this even in CLL patients, because of course, most of the effective agents need to be taken for long periods of time. And what one wants to do in that situation is to use medicines that are not only effective, but that can drive the disease down to the lowest possible state, potentially even unmeasurable, and then can safely stop. And that's what we've been doing in the context of this trial. So this is a whole new area in CLL where there's, um a shift um, going on from continuous therapy of drugs that have revolutionized the BTK inhibitors to limited duration therapy. In order for that to work, you've got to have very effective drugs that work quickly and get to deep levels. Um, so tell us about the particular combination that you chose, what the synergies you were looking for in here. It's, it's tricky when you're um, an oncologist, hematologist, because some drugs can sometimes interfere with the ability of another drug to work. So you look for drugs that are synergistic and don't have overlapping tox toxicities. So tell us about why you chose this particular combination and what would be make, makes this an appealing uh, therapy for CLL patients. Sure. So the rationale here actually starts from the, the most novel agent, which is this magrolimab medicine. So this is a medicine that's not yet approved for any cancer, uh, but there's actually a rationale for which it can work across a number of different cancers. It is a, a normal pathway that is important um, checkpoint for the innate or the normal immune system. So we've seen these types of immunotherapies become um, very effective in solid tumors when they block the um, adaptive immune system, when they block the checkpoints in T cells. With, so these are PD-1 inhibitors, pd one inhibitors. Those have not really been as effective in B-cell lymphomas as we would like. There's a few exceptions. So this is um, an opportunity to block the checkpoint on the innate immune system. And what that means is the pathway is Find known. the difference between the adaptive and innate immune system. Right. So the innate immune system doesn't need to see the invader before it knows how to kill it. So an adaptive immune system means that when you see a foreign object, whether it's a virus or, or, or bacteria or a cancer, that you can mount an immune resp response against it the next time. The innate immune system doesn't need that. They can sort of um, destroy these cancer cells, even though they've never seen them before. The process is called phagocytosis. That's the medical term. It means, and it really means eating the cancer cell in this case. So the pathway that's being targeted is actually called the don't eat me pathway. So cancer cells, you know, they, what they do is they avoid being eaten 
by sending the signal down this particular pathway. So if you then block that pathway, it enables the innate immune cells and macrophages and other cells like that to actually chew up and eat the cancer cell. Um, so that's been shown in preclinical models from researchers from Stanford to be very effective, very effective in a number of different cancers, leukemias, uh, B cell lymphomas, but even solid tumors. Now, the issue there is if you're going to unleash phagocytosis, you want to make sure that the cancers, the um, macrophages are actually eating the cancer cell and they're not eating something else. So in, in combination, what's added is these, you know, anti-CD20 antibodies we're using, obinutuzumab. What we think happens there is that places- Obinutuzumab the, is Gaziva for, yeah, that's what people know Right, about. exactly, yeah. Gaziva, and that's well known to be effective in CLL. What is doing in this case, we think, is it's placing the eat me signal on the B cell. So you're you're blocking the don't eat me signal and placing the, the eat me signal on the B cell, sort of selecting that for the one that needs to be phagocytosed. This strategy has worked um, pretty well in aggressive B cell lymphomas and even follicular lymphoma. We were um, started with that trial. That was a, um, a study that was sponsored by industry. We participated in that. And we saw that this could work even in patients in which chemotherapy was no longer working um, and could develop you know, complete responses even in those situations. So it was highly exciting. This was around 2016, 2017. What we're doing on this study is we're taking a step further. We're actually adding a third medicine, venetoclax. And it's the first time that the, the don't eat meat signal drug is being used in CLL. We're adding a third medicine because venetoclax is probably one of the best medicines that's been able to show that we can actually achieve, you know, MRD undetectable rates. Um, and so that's the, the strategy here is to use these three medicines in combination. We're working out the safety. Early results suggest that it's very, very safe. And we're trying to do this in a short period of time, as early as, as only six months, to try to um, enable one to get durable remissions that last hopefully years after the therapy stopped. Wow, that, that's amazing. That's really amazing. If we can do that in six months, that would be revolutionary. I do have a couple questions. Sure. There's been disappointment in the uh, overall in immune therapies in CLL because we have a cancer of the immune system and our, not only are our... our B cells corrupted. It seems our T cells have this fatigued, exhausted profile. And are, are you, is that an issue? I mean, it sounds like this works a little bit differently, but I would, that would concern me um, theoretically about yep. energy. The lack of energy means like lack of response to the immune stimulation that we see in CLL. Right. So we know that CLL, we've known for a long time that CLL is associated with this, um, you know, exhausted T cells or ineffective T cells. And that might be one of the reasons why, you know, blocking their, um, the, the checkpoint isn't enough. They may just not be functional even once the block is, is, is relieved. We don't know enough yet about um, the innate immune system, but we don't really have a concept that it's going to be exhausted. Um, and there, there should not be a situation that, that we're aware of in these B cell lymphomas where they're no longer effective. And so far, early results suggest that it still can be effective. So you're right to, con to concern yourself about that. But to this point, uh, we haven't observed that. So let me ask you, all, all drugs have side effects. And it sounds like if you put this, don't eat me, you take that away, that other things could be attacked, and that was clearly a concern. Are you seeing any adverse events with this combination that are unique to it? Right. So that's that's the right way to think about it. Um, so CD forty seven. That's actually what's targeted. That's the protein that sits on the outside of the cell. The CD forty seven is on many cells. Um, it's not only on um, B cells. It's on um, most cells, most immune cells of the body. the um, The difference is. The, what we're doing is we're tipping it in favor of phagocytosis. So the normal cells don't have a pro phagocytes, phagocytic signal on them. That's the purpose of the CD20. The one exception is older red blood cells, aging red blood cells. So, mo so normal red blood cells last about three months in the body. As they become older and, and senescent, what happens is they, they express CD47. So older red blood cells actually are susceptible to this this treatment, they'll, they'll die. So what you'll see happens is 
early on when you give the medicines, the patient will have their blood counts go lower, their hemoglobin will, go, will drop. And there is a risk that there will be hemolysis where they're actually chewed up. That's happened to a couple of patients on other studies. Of of, uh, red blood cells, yeah. Exactly right. And that's happened a couple of times in myeloid malignancies and AML and MDS. It's not yet happened in in lymphoma. And what we've seen is um, even though you get an initial drop in the hemoglobin, even when you continue giving the medicine, it'll come back up to normal levels because the red blood cells are no longer old. Those have kind of died off. And the younger red blood cells are no longer sensitive to that effect. And so you don't get much anemia. In fact, almost all of those side effects are early on in the first few weeks, and they don't last or persist even when you keep going with medicine. So uh, in any other adverse events, we know, um, what about the immune suppression that you get? That's obviously a concern, you know, in this pandemic time. and Yeah. So... Um, so the megrolomab itself won't have that effect. Of course, it's stimulating the immune system. But obinutuzumab and venetoclax both have a risk of neutropenia. Um, and that's low well, neutrophil that's, count, yeah. Uh, exactly, right. So low neutrophil count. And so that's probably the main thing we're focused on in this early part of the study, the, the safety part of it. We've had a couple patients that did drop their neutrophil count. So they did get neutropenic. We've not seen them have infection. And when, you, when you're able to stop the medicine, this bounds back to normal. So we've not yet worked, you know, we've not seen anything that limits our ability to give higher doses of medicines, but we're still working out the safety to make sure it would be, you know, proper to give to a, a, a broader number of patients. But early results are quite, um, uh, quite promising that we haven't seen any of that yet. Any other adverse events that you'd want to bring to attention to the community? Well, I think people are, familiar with the fact that the venetic class can cause diarrhea. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's also, it's one of the reasons why we like to give short durations of therapy. You know, when you have low levels of diarrhea, you can, you can handle that if it's only for a few months, if it becomes something that lasts every day for years and years and years, that's a different type of a side effect. Um, so in most cases, we're able to manage those um, just fine. Um, and I mean, I wouldn't say it has no side effects, but if you compare this three drug regimen to, to something like chemotherapy, there's far fewer side effects, at least across most patients. So we've been very happy with the safety profile so far. We're still trying to figure out, you know, how well it works and how often it works. Dr. Roszewski, let me ask you the, the question, maybe it's premature, but is there any result data that you have yet? Anything you can share um, uh, in the trial? Um, well, we, we have already seen um, patients that have CLL and other lymphomas that have, have um, achieved undetectable MRD states. Um, and we've seen this in cases that um, patients that have had multiple therapies before that didn't get that. And we've seen that both in um, uh, follicular lymphoma as well as CLL. So anytime you see that, even a small number of patients, it, it certainly increases your enthusiasm that you're on the right track. But to be able to prove that um, it's going to be an effective option, we need more patients. And, and, and so we're, we're in that stage now where we're trying to get more um, patients. One of the things is the patients, um, a good thing for patients is there's a lot of options, right? So there's a lot of different um, trials that people are testing, a lot of different ideas. And um, I think that's a, overall a good thing. Um, but that means that it's sometimes harder to accrue your studies as quickly as you would like, even when your idea is good and early results are promising. So... If I'm a patient that's interested, tell me a little bit about how they can find out more about the trial, what the, what the inclusion criteria are for the trial. And uh, we know we patients like the NIH trials because you get your meds for free and they cover yep. some of the expenses, a significant part of the expenses. So tell us if somebody's listening, um, who this trial would be appropriate for and how they would find out more about the trial. Yeah. So it's um, right now we're testing it in patients that um, have relapsed from refractory disease. For, for CLL, um, they have to have had um, two prior therapies. Um, we aren't testing it earlier. And in most cases, we would probably recommend that they've had a BTK inhibitor before they go on this study. That's that's one of the exclusion criteria. Uh, but it includes venetoclax. So there's not a, um, a need to have had uh, venetoclax therapy prior. Of course, like you say, um, the NIH will cover not only all visits, but even the first visit here to, to, to screen to make sure one is eligible. We wrote this trial ourselves. It's not an industry-sponsored study. And when we write them, we try to make our inclusion criteria as broad as possible, you know, recognizing that 
um, you know, patients that need clinical trials oftentimes have, you know, other things that are bothering them that, that make it difficult. So um, they are quite broad. You can look at them on clinicaltrials.gov or, or patients can contact me directly. Sometimes that helps have a conversation ahead of time to, to see if it's worth, you know, the trouble to even see if, if one wants to come to NIH and we can review the records or just have a discussion. Um, but that's certainly how we typically get, um, you know, patients interested in, in such in these trials. Well, I'll make sure I put up a link uh, on the website mm -hmm. um, in contact information if people want to find out more about the, the trial. Um, the trial has uh, a nice acronym. You want to uh, share the yeah. acronym the trial? Yeah, so um, it is kind of interesting. So um, it, it's called VENOM, and it's an acronym. So VEN, of course, is the first three letters of venetoclax, and then O is the obinutuzumab or gazeba. And then M is the mugrolimab. That's the newer medicine, the anti-CD47 antibody. So we call it venom. Uh, that helps us understand um, what we're talking about with trials. And it you know, makes pe gives people a nice image of, of what it is we're doing. You know, we're poisoning these cancer cells to some degree, I guess. Any final words or anything you want to say to the CLL community or the uh, broader lymphoma community? Well, I, I do think um, there are a number of combination therapies out there that one considers. Um, but just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, one of the things we've done, and we've seen this work in other lymphomas, is when you have these combinations, when they're safe, you can give them, um, even though it's three medicines, um, when you give it for short periods of time, we have seen that that results in durable remissions. And that's a strategy that we have championed over the last, you know, probably eight or 10 years. So uh, when they work, they really do, almost like we think of how chemotherapy combinations were put together, and that's the new world that we're in. So I think the CLL community will see more trials like this, that, as you've stated, that are that are testing shorter durations of therapy, um, and, and ultimately will be compared to, you know, single agents that go for long periods of time, and we just don't know the answer about what's more effective. Most patients we talk to um, prefer shorter durations of therapy. Um, if there's no, you know, evidence of one being better than the other. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. That's what our surveys have shown. Dr. Hrzewski, I've learned a lot from this, really a lot from this. This is very exciting. And uh, I look forward to more updates uh, from you as the trial data evolves. And we'll make sure we get up on, get up on the website with a link to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for the research that you're doing. Well, no, it's me. This should thank you. I'm I'm grateful that uh, there's interest in this, and um, I'm happy to have these conversations all the time because this is, of course, why we do what we do. I appreciate it. Thank you.